and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Mad Wall Poetry Podcast, where today I'm going to try to do this in a way where I could get through it in a certain amount of time and still be able to get to this meeting in a half hour and come back and finish the show and have it be seamless like a pair of leggings. Okay, let's see. Let's see how we can do this. So, I have gotten an email from a listener who did the right thing and told me that they just went and gave this podcast five stars and left a review. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, I didn't do that yet, then this is the universe telling you, what are you waiting for? Get on that. You had one job. What's wrong with you? That kind of thing. Yeah, that is what's happening now. So yes, that is amazing. And I really, really thank everyone who has been rating this show and who has given it five stars. And more than anything as well, not more than anything, equal, equal Dan. Um, I want to thank all the people who have been telling all of their friends how f- fucking amazing the show is. I know it's great. You know it's great. And now your friends know it's great. And that, my friends, is great. Like Tony the Tiger. Yeah. All right. So, um, since the last episode, I didn't do the shout outs until the very end. Dude, my hair is doing things that I don't understand. I'm sorry. Um, but again, you, you won't be able to see that unless you're watching this video. And the only way you're watching this video is if you're one of the amazing mofos over on YouTube. So let's just get into those shout outs, shall we? As my eyebrows bounce like many children on a trampoline or a bounce house. Okay, so let's get to it. Do it. So first, I want to give a big thank you to those beautiful motherfuckers over on Patreon. I want to give a thank you to Chase, to Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. You guys are the shit. Thank you so much. And now, for the motherfuckers who can actually see this face. Oh my god, if that bee comes in my house, I'm going to scream. I have a broken window! No, bee! Okay, I think I fixed it. I have one fucking busted out pane on my window right here. It's like an old ass window and there's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Each column of windows has ten panes on it and one of the panes broke off, broke out. This bee was hovering near the opening and I say, I say nay. You shall not pass, bumble fucking bee. Oh, now I'm going to be fucking paranoid all fucking day that a bee is going to fucking come in here. Uh, I don't know why I fucking care. I'm not allergic to bee stings. I could use my driver's license to pull the stinger out. I don't know what the big deal is. I just, I feel like he can do better. Go be better, bee. All right. So, I'm going to give a big thank you to all of you motherfuckers over in the YouTube thank you crew. So I want to give a thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to JH, to Jessica, and to Jan. You guys are fucking awesome. Thank you so much. And now, for the biggest Mama Jamas in Mama Jamma Town, I want to give a big thank you to all you motherfuckers over in the Anarchy Crew who make everything amazing and who are kicking ass and taking names. I want to give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim J., to Lisa, to Josh, to Alan, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, to Andrew, to Tim G, and to Chill Baby. Thank you all for being fucking awesome. And the biggest of all the thank yous goes to the number one chappie over in the chat book of the month club. I want to give a big thank you to the SDG. Thank you for being awesome and for being the biggest pledge in Pledge Town. You're the shit. Thank you. 
Oh my gosh, that was intense. Like a lot of the unhoused community in my neighborhood, that was intense. Whew. My God. Dude, I'm so tripped out about the goddamn beat. Oh, that's what this episode is going to be called. Bumbles, Bumbles, Bumblebee. Okay, now, um, I, I got a question, and I know, oh man, look at what happened when I did that to my hair. Ugh. I have, like, rooster cock hair. With the, all of that sounded awful. Good lord. Um, okay. Oh, man. It seems like everything I do to my hair somehow, somehow makes it worse. Let's just do this. Oh, that looks like I actually did my hair today. We'll, we'll leave it like that. The funny thing is, about an hour ago, I went and combed my hair and did the fucking thing. Did the washing the face, brushing out the beard, the whole fucking thing. And I was about to do the podcast. And then life happened, and I started doing a bunch of other shit. I, I even went into the closet and pulled out a shirt I hadn't worn in a while instead of just wearing whatever shirt comes out of the clean hamper after I do the laundry. And um, I haven't worn this shirt in some time, and I'm like, oh, I'll put this shirt on. Da -da 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 -da. Make everything new and different. And, um, yeah, so this is what's happened, guys. So the question... That arose. I wonder if I should have visual aids. No, it's okay. The people who watch this video have seen all the visual aids that I could put up a hundred fucking times. So, um, let's just do it like this. Oh, I actually have notes that I could pull up, so I will do that. Okay, so here's the deal. The question I got was as follows. Let me pull this motherfucker up. Let me pull this motherfucker up. Uh, uh, let me pull this motherfucker up. Whoop, whoop. Okay, I'm going to actually read this whole email because it filled my heart with joy. This is from Bree. Thank you, Bree. This says, hi, Matt. I left a review for your podcast on Apple Podcast, but I just wanted to fan person out directly. I love your pod so fucking much. It feels like I'm shooting the shit with a friend who curses just as much as I do. And after marathoning it for a week, it actually inspired me to open up my poetry folder. Boom. I was blown the fuck away by how much poetry I didn't know I had. I was even more excited that I actually liked two of my poems. So thanks for that. You are welcome for that, and thank you for letting me know that. And I bet it's actually more than two. I had an eyelash in my mouth for some reason. Falling apart! Bree continues. I do have a question for the pod. My bad if you covered this already. I'm listening to all the episodes backwards, so I promise to get to them eventually. But my question is this. How do you determine your prices? I can get my head around expenses, like what it takes to physically produce zines and books and shit. But do you incorporate other aspects of creating when considering pricing? Boom! This is such a good fucking question. Goddamn. And you know what else it is? It's a wonderful question about the business of being a writer, the business of being a poet, and the business of being a fucking publisher. I love it. This is my wheelhouse. Welcome to my house. This is my wheel. This is my house. Okay? So, we are going to answer this wonderful question from the lovely Brie. Thank you so much. Oh, pricing. Duh! Oh my fucking god. <laughs> so, I get a question about pricing, okay, for this podcast. Question about pricing. I'm looking through my notepad trying to find the thing that tells me what my pricing is 
and I can't find it. I'm putting in all these like keywords trying to pull it up and the um, file was called pricing. So there we go. Um, so here's the thing. If you are doing limited runs, you can have fun with the pricing. If you are not doing limited runs, I don't know how you do anything with the pricing. I know that like a lot of people, especially when doing zine fests and stuff like that, they will do stuff where, oh man, I did that thing with my hair again. I shouldn't have done it. They do that thing where it's like, <clears throat> like a mini zine is anywhere from a dollar to three dollars. A um, standard size zine is anywhere from, um, I guess the next bit would be six dollars. Let's just say five again, five dollars to seven dollars. Um, anything that's like premium products or premium, like really cool, like you could charge like maybe 10 bucks for it. Um, I've seen people charge like $12 for zines, $15 for zines, depending on like what they put into it. But because I publish so much, if I were to keep like an ongoing stock of everything I've ever put out, I, I wouldn't be, I, I would be drowning in my inventory. Okay. So like pretty early on, I decided that I'm only going to make a certain amount of each thing. Now there was a time when I only made a certain amount of things, but I didn't publicize that. I didn't tell people that. I didn't number the zines. I didn't sign the zines. It, it wasn't anything like that. I only started signing my chapbooks and zines when people asked me to sign it. And then I was like, oh, I should be signing these things. Okay. Because now it adds a layer of value to it. Um, the thing that makes it stupid is in order to make that make sense, I should probably only sign a certain amount of copies, okay? Um, but then it, it makes me feel shitty to not do that with the rest of them. So it, it almost like shoots me in the foot there. And I think that once the press gets up and going and I'm doing um, a lot of... Um, a lot more product because like um, off the grid was my last chapbook and there's 26 copies of that the one i'm doing in february which is now february apparently there is going to be 60 copies of that um i'm going to be moving closer towards 100 for my chapbooks and i think maybe what i'll do is like if I'm selling them direct, I will sign them. If they're being sold in stores, I won't sign them. I don't know. Figure that out. And then if I end up signing them later, then that's fine. But each of these things add value. And I did a video on YouTube. Maybe it was just for Poetic Anarchy. It might have just been a Poetic Anarchy thing. But I did a video about um, scarcity and rarity and what the difference is, okay? And you can price things accordingly because of how much there is. Now, this is something that is going to be really difficult for a lot of people to understand about themselves, okay? So when we get into rarity, something is rare based off of how many of those things there are, okay? So if, for instance, um, let's use uh, Ingrown Air is uh, one of my chapbooks I did back in like 2017, okay? That one I made 60 copies of, okay? So that being 60 copies, compared to all of my other chapbooks, it's not very rare. Like, probably if anyone gave two shits that would be one that would be easy to get your hands on, on the aftermarket. And this is what we have to think about. Understanding that you are good enough, that you have a fan base enough to exist on an aftermarket is something that you have to look at. 
you have to you have to realize like that people give a shit about what you're putting out if people don't give a shit about what you're putting out then why are you making more than just one copy for yourself you know what i'm saying like if you are publishing anything you should be publishing it with the idea that this is marketable and when i say marketable i don't mean to say that in a like cold corporate sense but i'm saying it in the sense of if you are putting all the time and effort into doing something you have to somewhere inside think people are going to enjoy this and if people enjoy it they will purchase it if people enjoy it a lot they will become fans and purchase other things that i do these things have to be said and they have to be understood and if you understand that then you have to start thinking okay well what can i do to do this and the reason why this comes up like this is because there's been copies of my books that have been sold online not by me for like 50 bucks 60 bucks you know what i'm saying so there's already like an aftermarket tick an uptick all right I think the biggest culprit of this was when uh, Fingering the Mundane came out, the first edition, because there were only 50 copies of that first edition. And 50 copies of an actual paperback is kind of, it seems like a bigger deal than 50 copies of a homemade like, chapbook or zine. I can't remember exactly, uh, I have screenshots of it. But they're in the UK. There were two copies of Fingering the Mundane, and one was going for like 80 something, and one was over 100 bucks. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Like, that's fucking crazy. You know? And there's been other things. Like, I know, like, kind of what my aftermarket value is because um, with my DVDs, like, if I signed a DVD. Um, back when I was making movies and the movies were coming out and I was doing signings, those DVDs would end up on eBay for anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks. Um, Creeperson CDs that I signed, would the same thing would fucking happen. So knowing that people give a shit about you is very important and should be an indicator as to how you price stuff. And not only that, but if you feel that you don't have that yet, create that. Make that thing happen. So if, like, you are, like, no one really knows what I'm doing, they don't really care about my shit, then start making things that, and now we're going to talk about scarcity in a minute here, but start making those things to where people will give a fuck. Like, make something. Like, I have some um, chapbooks that I, I think the lowest run I have on a chapbook is seven copies. Okay? So, that one right there, like, there's only seven of these. And there will only ever be seven of these. So, there will only be seven people in the entire world that have this chapbook signed by me and numbered. Okay, that's like a special important thing for people who fucking love your shit, you know, and you might have to hang on to those for a little bit. But as you start building your base and your audience and your fans, that will be something that will be really fucking cool to those seven fucking people. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so I'm going to run off to this meeting and then I will be right back and we will do the rest of the show. Okay, so a lot of time has gone by. Um, it's been hours. Um, I had one meeting, and then um, I had another meeting, and then the second meeting ran long, which is cool because that second meeting was an interview with someone amazing um, for the podcast, and that will probably be like two or three episodes worth of stuff. It, it was a ton of fun. So back to this. The main, the main idea here is rarity and scarcity. And that is how I price my stuff. Now, as far as ebooks go, obviously there is no 
rarity or scarcity with that. As far as, because I brought up Fingering the Mundane, the first edition of that only having 50 copies. The second edition of that is print on demand on Amazon. And there is no rarity or scarcity with that at all. In order to make scarcity of that, it would be me saying, hey, this second edition, I'm going to take off of Amazon in a month. So this next month is the last time you'll ever be able to get the second edition of this book. That could cause scarcity because now there's a time limit. Okay, so that is one form of scarcity. And then the other form of scarcity is based on how many copies you have left. And we'll talk about that in a second. But there was one thing I wanted to talk about that goes back to the rarity thing and me talking about how I have that one chapbook that there was only seven copies of it made. That whole concept and idea came from how punk bands used to make vinyl like records and shit way back in the day when i was collecting vinyl there was one of my favorite bands ever the misfits i loved them and wanted every odd weird thing i can get from them going through their catalog they would do different releases so it would be like they would put this one record out, but 500 of them would be on black vinyl. And then 100 of them would be on white vinyl. And then like 50 of... Like, you, you see where I'm going with this, right? Well, on one of their releases, Legacy of Brutality, they made 16 pink vinyl. So there was only 16 pink vinyl. And that blew my mind. And I like that was like my holy grail. I'm like, I need to get... The pink vinyl edition of Legacy of Brutality. And that became like my white whale. Like I was on eBay every couple days looking for someone selling the pink vinyl of Legacy of Brutality. And I think I saw it once and it was it had, like the price tag on it was so fucking high. I was like, oh, that's a fucking pipe dream. But that idea, um, it got me excited about... Not only the band, not only the music that they make, but that exact thing. And trying to recreate that excitement, that feel, that um, hunt. Because with the internet, it's really hard. Because, like, again, I'm old as fuck compared to all of you listening to this probably. But there was a time before the internet where if you wanted anything, you had to go out and hunt in record stores. You had to go out to garage sales and flip through milk crates of records. You had to go out and try to find these diamonds in the rough. And it's the same thing with collecting comic books, with collecting action figures, whatever it is you were collecting. If you wanted those things, you had to, it was an event to find those things. And now with the internet, there, there are no events anymore. So the only thing you can like recreate is the sense of the hunt that once all my shit hits aftermarket, hopefully there will be people who give enough of a shit to go on Abe, go on Half Price Books, go on Thrift Books, go on Amazon, go on eBay, looking at all these different places, trying to find one of the seven of I could write racetrack poems too, fucker. You know, like that whole idea. Now, with aftermarket, you cannot control the price, obviously, because it's a, a supply and demand kind of thing. But... When I said um, you have to create the rarity and the scarcity, that this is kind of how you do it. So I have chapbooks that have up to 60 um, copies out. Ingrown Air was one. I think, it, I think, honestly, it was actually like 65 or 66 or something like that. But since I can't remember exactly, we'll just say 60. And then Acid, I think, was 50. And then everything under that, the, the numbers changed. Like there was 20 of one, 
like the first two chapbooks I put out, I did 20 copies each. DNF, I think I did 10 copies of. And then when I started doing chapbooks again after taking a little bit of time off, and I started with Pharma Phoenix Rises, I did 50 of that, and then did 50 of Mart, and then did, I think, 48 of one night because the printer fucked up some of them. I did 50 of anxious anxiety and I did 50 of panic and I was looking at it and I was like, okay, if I continue to just make 50 of everything I make, that will be what my brand's rarity is. And so if you look at it like that, 50 isn't very rare if everything I make is 50. So then I was trying to figure out a way to make different releases mean more or just whatever, you know, necessity being the mother of invention. I realized that when I was doing the next book, I think it was 13 miles south of hell. I realized I only had a certain amount of a certain color card stock. And I was like, oh, well, if I just do this, then I think it was 25. I had 25 pieces of cardstock. I'm like, okay, well, then this one is 25. And so I did that. And then the next one, I think, was um, Death by Detura. And I had, I don't think I made 25 of that. I think I made 20. I had 20 pieces of that. So then basically when I was getting towards the end of all of this massive cardstock I bought for covers... I started like playing with stuff like that. It turned into like 20 for that and then funeral for a friend. I think I only made like 13 of that mainly because I didn't think anyone would want to read a chapbook of love poems to my dead computer. And then I did like 20 or 25 of um, P.O. Box 3054. I did 25 of shit poems. And then this is when I started really playing. I um, had 11 pieces of red card stock left. So I um, made Red Book and did 11 copies of that. And then I had this giant pile of pink card stock from this big batch of different colored card stock I had. And I'm like, what the fuck am I going to use this for? And I was originally going to use it to put out um, the revamped version of my novella, Bacon. I thought that would be cute. And I might still do that. I haven't decided yet, actually. And so I was like, okay, well, um, fuck, let me take a couple pieces of this. And I just kind of grabbed a handful out of it. And there were seven copies there. So that seven became, um, I can write horse or I could write racetrack poems to fucker. And that was as much thought as went into how many of that there was going to be. Um, I just pulled seven pieces. Uh, then, um, I'm trying to think. Oh, and then I was doing mini zines. Oh, and that reminds me, um, chicken strips I'm out of. Um, I think I still have it on my Etsy shop. Like I, it still says I have a couple left. But I, I don't have any left anymore. So I need to take that down. So um, I did Chicken Strips as a eight-page mini-zine. And Madness as a 16-page mini-zine. And w when I was originally doing those, I was like, I don't want to like have this be something that only has a limited run or whatever. But honestly, folding and gluing is kind of fucking annoying. So I didn't want to do this forever. So I'm like, okay, I'm just going to print out 50 copies of each of these and that'll be the fucking end of it. And I don't give a fuck because um, I don't want to keep doing this. So that's what I did. And Chicken Strips came out a little bit before Madness. So that one was uh, a bit easier. Oh, Coldest Beer in the Desert, I did 19 of because it came out the month of my kid's birthday and my kid was turning 19 and my kid did the cover. So that's why I picked 19. I'm trying to remember what came next. Oh, and then um, the, the type hard, the poetry on writing books. So type hard, type fast, type daily, type drunk. Those ones I bought 
um, specific cardstock for. And because there were four titles, I bought 200 pieces of cardstock, which would give me 50 copies each. So those are 50 copies each. That's just how that is. And then Los Angeles, I think there are 26 copies of that. MacArthur Park, I think there's 31 or 32 can't remember the exact number of that. And then I'm forgetting some in the middle. Oh, Preview of a Dangerous Mind. I don't remember what that was. Probably 30, I'm going to guess. Um, Last Chance for Gas, I think was 25. I feel like there was one more in there. Oh, Tonight. I think there might be 50. I think there might be 50 of that because I did 50 of one night. So I thought I would do 50 of tonight. But anyway, um... And then there's 24 of off the grid because that's how much paper I had left. So that's basically how I did each release as to how many copies there would be. So now when you look at that, like Red Book is going to be more rare. The Racetrack Book is going to be rare. Los Angeles, basically anything under 10, 20, like anything in between 10 and 20 is going to be be more rare now how i price my books is i right now in the last like year i've been making my base price nine bucks for a chat book some people would probably feel that's a bit high i used to sell them for seven but i put a lot of work into these things and i do it all the time and prices for everything have gone up So, like, I really don't feel like I'm taking anything away from the customer charging that. Now, if you are in the Anarchy Crew or on Patreon or on YouTube um, in the Thank You Crew or anything like that, you get discounts. You have a discount code and all that shit. If you're on my mailing list, I send out discount codes every once in a while. Um, If you buy stuff through the Etsy shop, you get discount codes sent to you uh, periodically throughout the year. And then if you're in the chapbook of the month club, you just get the chapbooks for free. So that works out. What happens is as the number that I have dwindles, the price goes up because now there is scarcity because I don't have many of these left. If I would have been smart about the chicken strips thing, I would have fucking told everybody, hey, I only have, I think I might have said I have two of these left at one point, but um, I I didn't like follow that one through. So I kind of screwed the pooch on that one. But if I would have done it right, I would have upped the price of it because that's the last one. Now, those weren't numbered even though I made 50 of them. They weren't signed unless someone asked me to sign it. So it, it's a little bit of a different thing there. But as far as the chat books go, depending on how many I have of something, I'm going to change the price of. And um, let me give you an example because I have a little list here of how I do this. So basically, if I have over 20 copies of a chat book, like anything over 20, they're going to be 9 bucks. That's like my starting base payment for that kind of thing um in between 16 and 20 it's about 12 11 to 15 15 bucks 6 to 10 is 20 and 1 to 5 is 25 there ever comes a time when like if i only have one left of like the racetrack book i might sell that for more because I know aftermarket, because there's only seven of those, that's going to sell for a lot. If I only have one left of Red Book, that's going to sell for a lot. That's how I do my pricing. And with my broadsides, it's the same thing. Like, um, the broadsides are roughly five bucks. And then if it gets to the point, because those are all signed and numbered too. And if it gets to a point where I only have a couple of those. I'm going to change the price on those. So as things are right now, I actually have to update this because this, I yeah, this already is wrong. That one is definitely wrong. Okay, so like I can write um, racetrack poems to fucker. That one's uh, 25 bucks. Funeral for a friend is 25 bucks. Death by Detura 
is 20 bucks. Um, Red Book is 20 bucks. I'm trying to think of which ones I have less than 10 of. Like, I think Los Angeles, I have less than 10 of. So that price needs to change. But yeah, so I, I base my pricing on rarity and scarcity. Not, I, I would say scarcity is what I base my prices on. Rarity, not so much because it's only as rare as I make it. So, um, but again, if I only make 15 of a chat book, as soon as I sell five of those, it moves into the tier of it being like a super rare. I don't fucking know how to describe these things, but that's how I do it. And not everyone does it like that. And that's fine. I don't expect everyone to like go, oh, this is a proven science here. This is what I'm going to do. This is just what I do. And this is what works. And this is what the people who like my shit are comfortable paying like, honestly, if I wasn't able to sell chat books for 25 bucks, like, I probably wouldn't do it. Because, like, what would be the fucking point if no one's buying it? So because there is a market for people to buy that thing, that's what it is. So as far as doing something that is an ongoing thing that you are just going to keep producing and keep producing and keep producing, um, because it's like that from the start it's hard to ever change the price of something you know so if you have this one zine that you've made like two or three hundred copies of and you expect to make another hundred or two more before you retire it but you you aren't even sure at that like you could just keep doing it forever there there isn't a idea for that so whatever price you make for it is going to be the price that you're stuck with for it um and then as far as like ebooks go this is kind of new territory for me and um, this isn't exactly what you asked but i'm going to talk about this like this basically i've been selling books on amazon since 2012 i think so 11 years now you can't really make any bit of rarity like as with the um example of the second edition of fingering the mundane okay like a digital product is just that a digital product you make one of those you've made a million of those like it it could be anywhere at any time People have been asking me for digital copies of my shit. And I've been really hesitant to do that because I feel like the digital copies take away from the physical copies and makes them not mean as much. But I know there are people out there who either have a hard time reading physical copies of anything or are in a country where me getting physical copies to them is very difficult. Um, and difficult for them to get. So digital copies would be a good thing. So I'm still toying with this idea in my head right now, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it. But what I'm going to do is there will be digital runs of certain things that I have, but the digital run will be for a limited time only. And th I mean, they're out there once they're out there and they can end up on pirate sites or the whole fucking thing, whatever. I don't give a shit at that point. But the idea here is, and it's not to make the price jump or anything like that. That's not going to be an issue. The issue is that digital is forever. Okay. But is there a way I could make digital at least feel temporary? Is there a way I could take digital and create a must-see or like a FOMO kind of thing with digital. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of the big thing I'm trying to grapple with right now. So I think I am going to be doing chapbooks digitally. But again, it'll be like this month's digital release is going to be in grown air. So if you don't have Ingrown Air and you always wanted Ingrown Air, you can now get a digital version of Ingrown Air. That's how that's going to break down. So that'll be interesting, I guess. Um, some people might dig that. 
I don't know when I'm going to do that again. Like, I have a million things on my plate right now. But um, that is something that is in the works. But back to the whole thing. Like, if you are familiar with research pubs, V Vale, who used to make um, Search and Destroy zine, like, he's a big proponent of rarity and scarcity. And, like, he's been surviving, I guess, doing it this way since the 70s. And if it worked for him, it should work for me. So I, I dig it. I dig it. And if you want to know, like, it's it's not 100% up to date, but if you want to know what things of mine have sold out, what things of mine only have a couple things left, what things of mine have a ton left, if you go to my website, IHateMountWall.com, and then click on any of the episodes or just click on some page once you get off that main page on the right hand side the whole sidebar is what's available what's not available and all that shit so that's just some food for thought so this has gone on long enough let's get to the butt plugs i got shit to do today welcome 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 to the plugs of yo butt First off, I want to, again, thank you, Bree, for sending in that amazing question that turned into an hour-long ramble. Um, But I want you guys to all know, Poetic Anarchy Volume 3 is out now. Link will be in the description below. You can get it. It's got poems by uh, Buddy Wild, Nate Colton, Mindy Simonson, uh, Tim Johnston, Thomas Crop, Hannah Fletcher, Garrett Carroll, O. Marie, and yours truly. So right now it's on sale for $9.99 in paperback. And um, once Poetic Anarchy Volume 4 comes out, that price will go up to $12.99. That's how I'm doing those prices right now. So that's fun. Let me see. What else is there? You could pick up a copy of my latest chapbook, Off the Grid. It's out now. Pick it up now because um, I I need to change the price since we were talking about um, scarcity and rarity. It has passed a level of where I need to change that price now. So get it now before I fucking get over there and change it. I'll give you a day. You got 24 hours. Oh, I just finished um, the Blood Rag issue 8. It's fucking amazing. Um, No one has seen it yet, but I will tell you who's in it. It's a great issue. I fucking love the stuff that's in it. Um, The poems in it are um, Land of Fire by Rich Boucher. Snickers Wrapper by Alan Mahan, Mirrors by B.L. Kohler, I Am Not Who I Thought I Was by T.T. Conley, Six Word Flash Fiction by Robert Fleming, and Now by Me. So yeah, so that should be up probably by the time you hear this. Um, I would give it a couple days just to make sure. Um, Probably by the weekend it'll be up. You guys know about the mentorship. You guys know about all my books and all my work and all that stuff. But here is the last thing I want to say. Episode 50 is approaching. And I want episode 50 to be a little bit different. I want questions from you guys. Okay? I want you guys to send questions to IHateMattWall at gmail.com. But I do not want any questions about poetry, publishing, or anything like that. I want these questions to be completely out whatever. You could ask me personal stuff. You could ask me things that I like, things I don't like. I don't know. Ask me whatever the fuck you want. It's kind of like an ask me anything kind of thing. Oh, there we go. It has a name. AMA. Duh. That's how we do this. So yeah, ask me something that isn't what is normally the thing here. So if you ever wanted to know something... Now is the time. Well, not now. Now is the time to send me the question. You're not going to get an answer until I do the actual thing here. So I think what this is, how we're going to do this, I think this is episode 48. 49 will probably be um, the first part of an interview that I have that is very special and is going to be a lot of fun. And then we'll do the Ask Me Anything episode 50 and then go back to... um, the rest of the interview i think that's how we'll do this so any question that has nothing to do with writing poetry publishing anything like that ask me anything else that's what it'll be an a m a e ask me anything else 
All right. So with that said, everybody, you know the drill. Keep buying my books. Type hard. Don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.